right, good morning, guys. How are we doing this morning? You guys hear me okay? No, Mia. Sorry. Uh, so I'm going to try uh, doing this from home today just as an experiment to see how well it works. Um, if you hear uh, an annoying little bark or anything in the background, that would be my dog who apparently thinks that she's entitled to a treat or something right now, which she is not because I'm teaching. I'm busy. Go back night night. So anyway, um, can somebody uh, type in Twitch? Oh, there we go. You, okay, so you guys can hear, hear me. All right, so um, uh, I've got a nice big monitor here at home, so I can actually see both the Discord chat and the uh, the um, the chat on stream. So I mean, uh, uh, Twitch. So, um, 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 so we're we're good there. Um, so if you've got a question, you can type it in either place. I'll be able to see it. Um, and also if you, if you want to speak, then, uh, you can do that in the, uh, uh, discord window and I'll be able to hear it hopefully. Um, so, um, right. Well, let's, uh, let's get to it then. So, uh, I figured it would probably be good for us to recap a little bit of the what we've done in the past, just to uh, make sure that we're all on the same page. So let's let's kind of go back a little bit and remind ourselves of the chain rule. And actually, you know what? I'm going to put uh, dates here. Um, so today is the 18th of March. Um, this will make it easier for you guys to follow if you look back at the PDF. Um, okay, so the chain rule recap. If we have a situation where we've got a function, um, let's say f of g of x, and the question is, what is the derivative of that? Then what we found, um, or what the rule is, is that it's f prime with the inner function plugged in times the derivative of the inner function. Okay, so a good example of that, we had stuff like x squared plus 1, say, squared, where um, uh, we could have taken the derivative by foiling it out and uh, then just doing the power rule like usual, um, and that, that would work perfectly well here, but the other way would be to say, okay, f prime is 2 x squared plus 1 to the first times 2x. So let me put some color here. So what happened was the exponent came down front. And that was this 2. Then you took 1 away from the exponent. And then what was the stuff on the inside? Well, it just stayed put. And then you multiplied by its derivative at the end. Um, so that was, that was pretty much it. Um, and uh, the benefit of this approach, uh, obviously, is if the exponent the, in this particular example were 2, then um, you wouldn't, uh, I mean, there you could FOIL it out. But if the exponent had been something bigger, like 1,000 or, well, really anything where it would be inconvenient to FOIL everything out, then um, uh, you don't have to is the, the good news. Um, so we could simplify this to just be, say, 4x times x squared plus 1. And if you wanted to distribute it, then you could. Um, so, um, right, there we go. Uh, OK, so that was just a quick recap of that. And then what we were finishing right before break was implicit differentiation. OK, and here the idea was um, that let's take an example equation, not a function, but an equation. So let's say we have something like that, which is the equation of the unit circle. Well, 
we could solve this for y in terms of x. And what we would get is um, we'd get y squared is, oops, sorry, uh, would be 1 minus x squared. And so if we solve for y, it would either be plus or minus the square root of 1 minus x squared. So in this case, we actually have two functions, not one. The plus version is one function and the minus version is the other. Um, and if we wanted to take the derivative, well, we could do it basically the same way. So let's just take the plus version for the moment. Uh, I'm going to write that as 1 minus x squared to the 1 half. And then y prime would be 1 half times the stuff to the negative a half, because I'm taking one away from the exponent. And then I need to multiply by the derivative of the stuff on the inside, which in this case is minus 2x. Uh, and if I simplify that, then uh, the 2s cancel, which is kind of nice. And so I get that. Um, and if I had done uh, the minus version instead, then what would have happened is I would have an extra minus sign there for the minus version. And if I had an extra minus sign in front, that would negate the, uh, the numerator here, uh, this guy here. And so that minus would disappear. And so in general, we would get y prime is, um, it'd be minus plus x over square root of 1 minus x squared. Okay, um, so that would be if we did it the explicit way, um, where we solve for y as a function of x, and then do the derivative rules as usual. Um, we could have done this a different way, however, and uh, so we'll, we'll do the implicit way on the next page. Um, so instead, we say, okay, let's start with our equation and treat y as if it is really y of x, okay? Uh, meaning that it's a function of x, we just don't necessarily know the formula for it. Now, in this example, we, we do know the formula for it. We did that on the last page. Um, but let's just pretend that we didn't. So um, when we see y squared or x squared, well, x is x. It's not a function of x, or if it is, it's sort of the, a trivial function of x. So the derivative of x squared would just be 2x. But the derivative of y squared would be 2y times dy dx, and the reason for the dy dx is the chain rule. Uh, let me write it this way. Okay, because y is a function of x, we just don't know the formula for it. The other thing to note here is that this depends on x, the y, and x is the variable. Whereas with x squared and x, those were the exact same thing. And so if we multiplied by anything here, it would be dx over dx. And this is just 1. So um, even though we're not explicitly writing anything, it's as if it's there. Uh, OK, so um, let's uh, put this together for a problem. So if we had x squared plus y squared equals 1, We'll take the derivative of both sides. And so we would get 2x plus 2y dy dx equals 0. Um, common mistake on this is that you get so excited about the, the dy dx stuff that you forget that the derivative of the constant is 0. So just be careful there. OK, so now this is an algebraic equation with three variables. It has x and y like before, but it now has a new variable, 
this dy dx thing. And of course, the whole point of calculus, well, half the point of calculus, is to um, find uh, the derivative of functions. So uh, at this point, all we have to do is some algebra. The calculus is over uh, at this step. We just need to find dy dx. So I need to solve for dy dx algebraically. Okay. Um, and so the first thing I'll do is move the 2x to the other side. So I have 2y dy dx equals negative 2x. And then I just need to divide by the 2y. So dy dx is negative 2x over 2y, which is negative x over y. Um, and you might ask, how does this jive with the previous answer? Um, we had y was plus or minus the square root of 1 minus x squared. And so if I substitute that in, then I get this, which is exactly what we had when we did it the other, uh, the implicit way, or excuse me, explicit way. Um, okay, but the, uh, the advantage of uh, doing this the explicit way, or sorry, implicit way, is uh, that we don't necessarily have to actually know the formula for y, and there are plenty of situations where it's actually impossible or really inconvenient to solve for uh, y. Um, okay, so let's let's look at this graphically for a moment. So I'm going to switch over to um, uh, Mathematica. This will take a second to load. Okay, so I've got uh, Mathematica loaded here, and uh, sorry, you get to deal with my beautiful mugshot. Um, and let me blow it up so that it's easier to read. Uh, let's try 200%. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to define a function. Or actually, I'll do I'll do it this way. So I'm going to do a what's called a contour plot and then I'm going to type my equation okay and not surprisingly we get a circle um, now just uh, so we're on the same page here uh, that is actually double equals right there so Mathematica like many programming languages uh, requires that uh, you use equal the equal symbol in two different ways. Uh, if you're talking about uh, assigning the value of something to be 12 or whatever, then you would say that variable equals single equals 12. Um, but if you're trying to ask, uh, is it the case that something is equal to 12, then you need double equals. So the syntax here for the contour plot is... Um, uh, to use double equals, not single equals. And then the, the stuff to the right here is basically just specifying what range of x's and y's I'm interested in plotting the, uh, the uh, equation over. And since I know this is the unit circle, I figured just negative 2 to 2 uh, in both uh, directions would work. Okay, so the reason I wanted to graph this is because we can then talk about the tangent lines. Um, so we first off, we need to pick a point on the unit circle. Um, so let's take, for example, um, let's take the example point zero comma one. Um, in this case, it should be pretty obvious what the tangent line is, because that's basically the top of the circle.
but let's make sure that this the calculus justifies that. So if um, I have this point, then dy dx at this point uh, is negative the x coordinate over the y coordinate, which is zero. And then I know the equation of the line because it would be, oops, that. And now where the numbers are coming from here is the slope is this number, and then the coordinates are telling me the, uh, the two numbers there. Um, and uh, so, great. Okay. So now in this case, this equation simplifies dramatically to just y equals 1, and that shouldn't be a shock uh, given what we had. Um, or we could leave it as y minus 1 equals 0. So what I'm going to do here in my contour plot is I'm actually going to add an equation uh, to my list, and then it will produce the graph of the corresponding equation, the second one, um, and it does it in order. So blue is first, orange is second, green is third. We'll use uh, one more example here in a moment. So the tangent line, that looks pretty tangent to me at the point zero comma one, so everything's cool. Um, now, you might be wondering, um, there's a couple ways to think about this. What about if I had picked the point one comma zero instead? So either in Twitch or uh, Twitch chat or Discord chat or um, uh, Discord uh, text chat, tell me what, um, oh, it would help if I were actually in the Discord chat so I can actually hear you guys. I'm sorry. Uh, let's see. It's, where's Discord? Yeah, okay. Sorry, it turns out I wasn't in the, the calculus Twitch after all. Um, or I mean, uh, Discord. Okay, so what would happen if um, what would happen if uh, uh, we were at, say, the point one comma zero over here on the far right instead. And this is where you either speak or type something and everybody's happy. Okay, so what's undefined, Mr. Uh, Matt? Yeah, or Cameron. Something's undefined, but what's undefined? <laughs> um, yeah, wake up, guys. I know you haven't had a trip to the brew yet this morning, neither have I. Yeah, so the, the slope is the problem here. Um, and so we can see that because if we went go back to what we had a minute ago, we had dy dx is, uh, what was it, negative x over y? Okay, so if y is zero, we have a little bit of a problem, okay, that we get an infinite slope um, because we'd be trying to divide by zero. Uh, so in that case, uh, we have to sort of pause for a moment and say, well, what kind of shapes have... Uh, undefined slopes. What kind of lines have undefined slopes? The vertical ones. Uh, and vertical lines can be written in the form x equals something, whatever the x coordinate is, and the y coordinate is, is basically irrelevant. So here at the point 1 comma 0, the x coordinate uh, is z uh, 1 and the y coordinate is 0, so the equation of the line that goes through this point should just be x equals 1, okay? And uh, so if I go ahead and tack that on, then we get the tangent line through that, uh, that point there. And we could have just as easily done this at the far left point, negative 1, 0, or the point sort of down here at the bottom of the circle, uh, either way. Okay, so... Um, you do kind of have to worry that if 
you plug in your point to your derivative uh, formula, whatever you get, and um, you end up with uh, uh, an undefined expression, that should just say, oh, that means I've got a vertical line, and vertical lines we have to deal with specially, uh, but horizontal lines, uh, not too big of a deal. Um, okay, so any questions on those two examples? We'll go on to a new page. Okay, so can I get a, I'm good, or sounds great, or uh, clapping emojis, or... Okay. All right, so you guys are good. Um, Cameron's typing, so let's see what he has to, to contribute this beautiful morning. Uh, can you show the equation of uh, how finding the derivative of the unit circle gives the tangent line y equals 1? Yeah, let me uh, switch back to um, the iPad. Okay, so that would be, um, that would be here. So um, y equals 1, uh, how we got that was, uh, so this would be uh, the sort of part there where it says tangent lines. Um, the general equation for the derivative was um, this here, right? So that's what we uh, decided or cooked up a moment ago. And so if I know the point, the point had x coordinate 0, y coordinate 1. I just need to plug those things into uh, the derivative formula, which in this case is negative x over y. So I do that, and that got us negative 0 over 1, which is just 0. Okay, and then from there, um, we go to here. Okay, which, uh, so what, what, uh, what equation was I using there? What was the, the secret sauce to that? Like, how did I know to write all that stuff down? Yeah, point slope form, exactly, right. So we've got, this is y minus y naught equals m x minus x naught, and then I just plugged in um, plugged in the specific numbers. So I knew the point, those were the things I circled in green. I knew the slope because we just figured that out. It was zero, and then I simplified that expression, and that's what got us that, y equals one. Um, okay, Gucci? Yeah, good. Uh, okay, so Willie's typing something. Let's see what Willie has to contribute. All right, and Mr. Bacon says Gucci. Awesome. Uh, okay, so um, uh, Willie, you uh, you Gucci also? Or Prada? Uh, okay, I'm gonna assume you're Gucci. And we'll uh, carry on. Um, okay, so uh, so let me go over to a new page here, and let's pick a point on the unit circle that's not quite so easy. Um, so I'm going to choose the point. Oops, let me go back to black ink here. Um, so let's choose um, let's choose a point that's not quite so easy. Let's choose this one. Okay, and you might ask, where did I come up with that point? Well, because this is the unit circle and I remember my trigonometry, then um, uh, I know that that happens to be a point on the unit circle. No, no, 
Um, sorry, the dog is is being ornery. She wants a treat, and she's not getting one. We may have to train her on the squirt bottle trick. So, uh, okay. So, uh, so in this case, let's just remember our dy dx formula was negative x over y that we solved for before. And so the the slope here, this will be a little bit messy. It'd be negative the x coordinate divided by the y coordinate. Okay, and then we've got fraction division going on. So when you divide by a fraction, you multiply by the reciprocal, and you get that. And if you're bothered by having square roots and denominators, which I'm not, then you could always multiply, um, rationalize the denominator and get that. Um, but um, I'm cool with either the unrationalized form or the rationalized form. It doesn't really matter. Um, so, okay. Um, so now the, the, uh, that's the slope. And then we need to do a point slope form. So y minus the y coordinate. Oops, that looks terrible. Y minus the y coordinate is equal to the slope times x minus the x coordinate. And uh, in this case, we could actually just leave the equation in that form. Um, okay, so make sure you scribble down that equation. Uh, here real quickly, and I'm going to put this in Mathematica, and we'll see that we actually do have uh, tangency um, uh, in just a second. So, uh, okay. So, yeah, so scribble that down. I'm going to switch back over to uh, Mathematica, and uh, let me go ahead and throw in one more equation. And in this case, what I'm going to do is... Um, I'm really just going to type the equation uh, exactly as I've written it in point-slope form and not worry about putting it in y equals form. Um, and then as a contour plot, Mathematica will just deal with it. And there we go. So I chose the point 1 half comma root 3 over 2. Um, and if you think about that, what... Um, what angle did I kind of use here? Like, how did I pick one half comma root three over two? I knew that was going to be on the circle, um, just because. Uh, but but how do I know that that this looks right? All right, come here, come on. All right, and while you guys are thinking about that, let's let's have a look. This is Mia. This is my puppy, and uh, this is where you all go. Oh, what a pretty puppy! Yes. Um, so she is a Cairn Terrier, and uh, that means she is very stubborn and persnickety and ornery, but loyal to a fault. And um, Anyway, yeah, so if you hear barking or anything, that's that would be this one trying to get my attention to extract a treat, tweet, a treat out of me, not a tweet. Um, so, anyway. All right, Mia, you have to go sit back down. Um, yeah, is it ratings or something? So, yeah, exactly. Um, the uh, This happens to be the coordinates of the point where the angle is uh, 60 degrees or uh, in radians, that would be pi thirds. And I know that that uh, for the unit circle, because um, on the unit circle, uh, then the x coordinate is always given by the cosine of the angle and the y coordinate is always given by the sine of the angle. Um, and so if I use theta equals uh, pi thirds or 60 degrees, then I get uh, cosine of 60 is one half and sine of 60 is root three over two. Um, so I just, uh, you know, kind of use the knowledge that we have of trigonometry uh, in order to, uh, to get this. 
Um, and of course, we could have done this for any other point on the thing. Um, but uh, yeah, there we go. Uh, okay, so um, hopefully that's a good recap of the implicit differentiation stuff. Uh, any questions on the implicit differentiation, sort of generally speaking, and then we'll uh, we'll look at a, kind of a nice application of this, uh, well, several nice applications of this as we uh, keep going. All right, so pausing for the questions. Oop, and I'm sorry, I uh, forgot to switch back over to the iPad where I wrote out the angles. So. Uh, let me get let me get my magic program going. Okay. Um. So, uh, all right, Willie. Let's see what you have to say. You're good. All right, everybody else good? Yeah. Okay. So, um. So let's look at kind of the the next big thing that has to do with this, um, which is inverse functions. Okay, so um, first off the definition, um, f of x and g of x are inverses if f of g of x equals g of f of x equals x. So essentially the idea there is that if you plug one of them into the other uh, in either of the two possible orders, if when you simplify everything you just get x, then the functions are inverses. And we know lots of examples of these. So um, one would be, for example, let's take... Um, the cube root of x and x cubed because the cube root of x cubed equals um, x and that's the same as the cube root of x cubed. Okay, now uh, this one's going to annoy you guys. What is the square root of x squared? see what we have to say. What are you guys tempted to write? Yeah, plus or minus x, okay. Not quite, but you're on the right track. Uh, you're tempted to just write x. Uh, unfortunately, that is not true. It's actually absolute value of x. Um, and so the absolute value of x is where the pluses and minuses that you guys are used to running into come in. Um, and so you do have to be a little bit careful from the algebra standpoint of when you do this sub substitution. Um, so uh, maybe word of caution is even square roots and even powers, it doesn't work the way you'd like it to. Odd ones like the cube root and x cubed work fine, no issue. Um, so just be a little bit careful about that. Um, but we also have some other examples. So, for example, e to the x and the natural log of x uh, have this property. Uh, and that's very useful, of course, because uh, anytime we have equations involving one, we can usually undo things by using the other. Um, and uh, then, you know, we could cook up a whole bunch of, of other examples. Uh, so let's just take a linear example. So let me take... Um, Um, let me take uh, a situation where I've got a straight line, y equals mx plus b, and I'm going to assume that it's not a vertical line just for uh, sake of convenience, um, and so that I'll assume that the slope isn't zero. Uh, or excuse me, I'm assuming it's not a horizontal line. Sorry, misspoke. Um, okay, so how do I find the equation of the inverse? Well, basically, I need to do some algebra. So the first step is everywhere you see an x or a y, you replace it with the other letter. 
Okay, so I saw y equals mx plus b. Every time I saw a y, I replaced it with an x. Every time I saw an x, I replaced it with a y. And that gave me this new equation here. And now this, I want to solve that for y. Okay, and in this case, that's not too difficult. The first thing I need to do is subtract b. And then I need to divide by m. Okay, and um, if I write this as, um, uh, let's see here, um, if I write this as x over m minus b over m, um, then, um, uh, yeah, then, then we're good. Uh, okay, so that gives me the equation of the inverse function. And um, in this particular uh, situation, um, like let's choose some example um, example numbers. Um, so let's say that uh, m was 2 and b was 3. I'm just making those up. Then the inverse is y equals x over 2 minus 3 over 2. Okay, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pop out back over to Mathematica. And let's plot this and see if it makes sense. So, um, so I'm going to do a plot of, and my original equation was uh, 2x plus 3. Uh, my new equation was x over 2 minus 3 over 2. And let me just pick a range of x. Well, actually, the b here is 3, so let me do um, uh, a bigger range of x's and y's so that I catch everything. Um, oops. Don't specify the y's on a plot. Okay. Um, but I'm going to add a few things here. Uh, I'm going to make it the graph look a little bit different. Okay, so what I did was I uh, restricted my x's and y's both to negative 4 to 4, and I just kind of picked that because it would uh, look decent. Uh, and then this aspect ratio basically means that the plot appears sort of square. Uh, so uh, on the monitor, it means that it spaces the x's the same way it spaces the y's. Um, that's, you know, kind of like uh, if you used graph paper or something, how many units are you using for each, uh, each direction? Um, okay, so the reason I wanted to plot that is what, uh, what do you notice about the two graphs here? So the blue one is my original one, and the orange one is my inverse function. How do I know that these two things are inverses just by looking at the graph? I need to get like Jeopardy music or something so that, uh, yeah, do like all the cool streamers do and have like donations and things like that. Yeah, exactly. It's a reflection of line Y equals X. Okay. So, oh, sorry. Mia, no, dog, hush. Sorry about her. Um, okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add in an equation. Mia, shut up. No, hush. Um, I'm going to add in the function x, which is there. Um, so the green line that got added is the line y equals x. And then if I look at the graph, then if I imagine that the green line is kind of a mirror, then the blue line would reflect to the orange line and vice versa. Um, so that's a quick graphical way to... Uh, 
uh, to tell that you actually have the correct inverse. Just graph what your original was, graph the inverse, and if you get this sort of graphical property, then, uh, then you've probably done everything okay. Um, okay, so the reason that I wanted to bring up inverse functions is, so let's go back to the iPad, um, is uh, what we're interested in is what, uh, how do inverse functions and their derivatives play together? Okay, so this is where the calculus comes in. Okay, and what I'm going to start here is, let's say that um, um, if I have a function f of x has inverse f inverse of x, okay? Um, and so what does that mean? Well, it means, for example, that f of f inverse of x is equal to x, and if I plug them in the other way, I would get this. Okay, so the question that we want to answer is what is the derivative of f inverse of x? Um, and I'm going to be very careful here to write ddx um, because, as you can tell in my handwriting, f inverse is going to look a whole lot like f prime, so we need to be really careful to not mess this up. Um, so what I can do here is actually treat this almost as an implicit situation. So um, let's take the, uh, the situation where I have f of f inverse of x equaling x, I'm going to take the derivative of both sides. So the derivative of f of f inverse of x should be the derivative, oops, should be the derivative of x. Now on the right hand side, that's easy. The derivative of x is one, no big deal. On the left hand side, we're going to have to do some chain rule business. So because we have one function, f inverse, inside the other function, f. Okay, so what is the derivative here? Well, it's f prime with the f inverse plugged in times the derivative of f inverse. Okay, so um, it gets a little cumbersome to not use the prime notation, so I'm going to make my primes really primey, really slopey. Um, so that was kind of a big jump, but let's make sure that we're clear on the, the details. So what did I just use here? What gave me this term right there? So why, why did I have to multiply by that f inverse prime? Yeah, bingo, chain rule. Okay, so um, the goal here was to find the derivative of the inverse. And we now have an algebraic expression. The derivative, oh, let me write it in brackets. Um, uh, the derivative of the inverse is one over this expression. And let me make that, let me rewrite this. F prime of F inverse of X. Okay, so basically the derivative uh, is not just the reciprocal, but it's sort of the derivative of the other one uh, the original function with f inverse plugged in 
and it's the reciprocal of that. Okay, so um, so if we apply this to our previous problem, it'll be almost a little bit too easy here. We had this, and then our inverse was, uh, let's go back, it was x over 2 minus 3 over 2. Then um, what is f inverse prime here? Well, it would just be 1 half, right? And that's easy because it's uh, we have an explicit formula for the inverse. And what is f of x is derivative. It's 2, okay? So is 1 half equal to 1 over uh, f inverse of... Um, or sorry, I wrote that wrong. Uh, that should have been f prime of f inverse of x. Uh, it should be, uh, and it is because, well, what is f prime? It's 2, constant. So what happens if I plug something into, in place of x, in a constant? I get exactly the same thing back. I just get that constant. And so uh, if I plug in f inverse to the function 2, I still get 2. It's still a constant function. And so then uh, all I get is 1 half, which is what we were supposed to get. Um, now, if I had picked uh, two functions that were maybe a little bit uh, more exotic, then, uh, then we would have had maybe a little bit more work to do. Um, okay, so where we're going to use this um, uh, next time is to talk about uh, inverse trig functions and a little bit of exponentials and logarithms. Um, and uh, the inverse trig functions are a little bit annoying because they don't technically, uh, trig functions don't technically have inverses, but they mostly do. And so we'll have to uh, okay, so how did I get the one half? Well, um, which one half? The this one half here in green oh, for the final answer. Okay, so um, f prime of x. So let me circle this thing here. That's what we need to consider, right? So f prime of something. Uh, f prime of some stuff means everywhere you see an x in f prime, you replace it with what's on the inside. But what is f prime of x in this particular problem? Just because of the functions I picked. It's 2. Well, Two is a constant last time I checked, right? So what happens if you plug something into a constant function? Uh, okay, so question mark. All right, so let me uh, let me highlight. So, in our particular example, f prime is a constant function, and it's just two. And I'm plugging in that thing to it. Well, a constant function means exactly that. It's a constant. So if I plug something into it, well, there's nothing to plug into. There are no x's, right? So no matter what you plug into a constant function, what's it going to spit out? That constant, in this case, is 2. So that means that the denominator of that expression in this example is just that constant value, which is 2. And since I had 1 over that, well, there's your 1 half. Now, the, maybe the other question is, how did I know it was supposed to be 1 half from the beginning? How did I know this 1 half? Well, what's the derivative of that function?
to the one that uh, I kind of boxed in red. Yeah, it's one half. Okay. And so that's why the one half on the left I knew was true, because that is this value the derivative of the inverse function. And since in this example, we actually knew the inverse function, then, uh, then we were good. Um, okay, so take a minute and look back at this. Um, it may take a minute to sink in um, because yeah, there's Fs and F inverses and stuff flying around here. Um, okay, so on Wednesday, we'll, uh, we'll carry on with um, inverse trig functions and and maybe an example that's not quite so uh, quite so silly um, all right so any any questions thoughts uh, etc I'll have a bunch of updates uh, to post to canvas and some uh, you know changes to things especially since uh, as you guys probably saw yesterday we're gonna be doing this uh, for the rest of the semester which is unfortunate but uh, you know say la vie. Um, so if you don't have any questions, you can go ahead and uh, sign off and I'll end the stream. Uh, and if you've got anything, then, then let me have it. All right, looks like we're good. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, end the stream, and uh, I will see some of you later today, Willie, and um, uh, everybody else. So we'll see Wednesday, if not uh, before. All right, hang in there, guys.